Welcome into the Hang Time Podcast. I'm your host, Seku Smith, here in the bubble, the basketball Shangri-La that it is. Quite restrictive, but I'm not going to harp on that today. Not when I've got my man Stan Van Gundy here joining me. Coach, loved all of your calls on TNT before I got to the bubble. Um, now that I'm here, I don't get to hear the calls anymore uh, on the broadcast. So it's kind of it's shifted my senses, you know, in terms of being in in the building watching the game as opposed to when you're watching it on TV. I'm curious what you think in terms of what we've seen to this point, Miami advancing to the Eastern Conference Finals for the first time since 2014 over Milwaukee. What have you seen in terms of a team like Miami finally breaking through? What pushes that team to this point now, do you think? Well, I, I think they've been playing at a really high level. Um, they play both ends of the floor. I think that has really helped them. Obviously, their three-point shooting opens up everything. They were the second-best three-point shooting team in the league during the year. I think they've been the best or the second-best team in the playoffs shooting the three. That opens everything up. And compared to a lot of other teams, even though they clearly have their two main guys in Butler and Adebayo as stars, they're really pretty balanced. and. You can't just key on one guy. Goran Dragic has been unbelievable. Maybe their best offensive player in the playoffs overall. Tyler Hero, is he just seems to be getting better every day. Duncan Robinson hasn't been great in the playoffs, but he's such a threat. Kelly Olenek has played really well. Like, you know, you go in and let's say you're going to play the Lakers. Okay, how we guarding LeBron, how we guarding AD. Boom, you can't do that to Miami because they've got a lot of weapons. They move more offensively than most teams. They share the ball better. And then at the other end, they're going to guard. So uh, right now they've played better than anyone else. And we'll see what happens. That's no guarantee heading into the conference finals. But so far, I think you would agree with me. They've certainly played better than anybody in the East. To me, they've been the most consistent of any team in terms of playing at a high level. Even the game that they lost, and they've only lost one game, they, it's not like they played terrible. They, they got outplayed, which was a rarity for them. They sweep Indiana in the first round, basically a gentleman sweep of the Bucks, And it's not like they did it all with the Giannis Antetokounmpo out. I mean, that was only in game five that, that the Bucks didn't have Giannis, and certainly in part of game four. Knowing what you know about the heat, that culture, the makeup of the people involved, should we be surprised – that the Heat team looks like it does with vets and the type of catalyst that Jimmy Butler is. To me, they're just such a Heat-type team when you look at them on the hoof, you know, the, the parts and how they fit. Well, they are. I mean, that, that is a team. That, that is a great description. This is probably, and I don't mean this as any disrespect, because the LeBron, Wade, Bosch days were certainly the best days ever in the Heat organization. But this is the more prototypical Miami Heat team. You know, they're doing it with talent. You don't win without talent. But it's not overwhelming star power. It's a bunch of really good players coming together. It's a mix of veterans and young guys. They've done a great job with their player development on the young guys. Adebayo, uh, Hero, Nunn, Robinson. All the things that I think the Heat have always prided themselves on, they do well. I think Eric Spolster is finally, I say finally as a friend of his, and it's frustrated me, I think he's finally starting to get his due as a coach. I know, Seiko, you and I have talked about this, but when you're coaching LeBron, you can never get any credit as a coach. Right. Never. Right. Frank Vogel's doing nothing right now, <laughs> and, and I get it. He's great. So Eric didn't get his due in those days. I feel like he's getting his due now for putting this together. It's just all come together. And then you always need a little bit of an element of luck, okay, on this. And I'll just say that what happened to them that initially you looked at as sort of a setback became luck is Kendrick Nunn, who's a really good player. He got COVID. He's out. They're forced into starting Goran Dragic. That has been a major plus for them. 
Not that Kendrick Nunn's not a good player, but you're heading into the playoffs. Dragic's experience and the fact that with Nunn out, he's getting bigger minutes and playing great. They wouldn't have made that move if they weren't forced into it. So you need a little luck. And their luck initially looked like bad luck and turned into really good luck. (laughs) It struck me, Stan, watching game five. You talk about experience and what that means and how it matters in this league. I don't think it's any coincidence that Jay Crowder, Andre Iguodala, Goran Dragic, Jimmy Butler, they all played critical roles, obviously, but it was the way they did it in that moment. Now, what Hero did and what Bam Adebayo has done, that's, to me, the shocking part, that players that young, that relatively inexperienced in Adebayo's case, but really in Hero's case, he's 20 years old. And to have the confidence to play on that stage the way he did last night was stunning. I mean, he was looking over at the family section after making plays and hollering and You just don't see it from a guy that young in those moments. From the very beginning of the year, though, what strikes you about him is his confidence and fearlessness. I mean, he's just, I don't think the guy realized, even when he came into the league, like this is the best league in the world (laughs) and this is hard. He played from the beginning like he belonged and he was as good as anyone on the floor. I mean, I remember their early season game against. Milwaukee in Milwaukee when Jimmy Butler was out and he was going at it like this is the most normal thing in the world you know and he's three or four games into his career so nothing's gonna phase him and I think also though it helps him having those veteran guys around number one the pressure's really on them not on him if Tyler Hero goes out and goes 0 for 4 in the fourth quarter well Then in the last two minutes, we'll just give Jimmy the ball and, you know, we'll figure it out from there. Or we'll give Goran the ball. We'll figure it out from there. So there's not the pressure, but also there's those guys who have been there to help him through the moment. Having coached and been in charge of basketball basketball franchise, I ask you this one question about the Bucs. There'll be a rush to judge what they've done and, and where they are. And there'll be people saying, let's change this. Let's do this. Let's go this direction. Let's change this. Let's do that. Is there something to taking a breather and and kind of stepping back before you make any decisions in the Buck situation, given where Giannis is in his career, free agency looming, obviously, potentially for him, these kind of franchise turning decisions you potentially could make. Do you do that in the moment or do you take the time needed to really step back and look at it from a a different perspective before you do any of that if you're the Bucks. Well, I do think they need to get some perspective. You know, the first thing is number one seed two years in a row in the league and they're underachieving in the playoffs. And I don't think that's the case, first of all. I think what they're doing is they're overachieving in the regular season. Mm. I went through that when I was an assistant to Pat Riley in Miami. So we would have these great regular seasons every year. And then my brother's Knicks teams would knock us out of the playoffs. And, you know, there started to be some noise on us underachieving and everything else because we were seated ahead of the Knicks every year. Right. And my response to that at the time was, no, we're not underachieving in the playoffs. We're overachieving in the regular season. The regular season is a test of, How ready are you to play every night? Let's say, how many nights can you get to 85 or 90% of your max? And that is a huge challenge. And the Bucs, because of Mike Budenholzer's work, but more so because their best player is ready every single night, they are a consistent team. But the playoffs, everybody's ready, as you know, every night. There's no... Thursday night games in Indiana in February, you know, where people might be down. Everybody's ready to go. So the playoffs are a test of what are you like at your best? And I don't think the Bucks really maybe measure up quite to some of those other teams at their best. And, and I think they need to sit back and take a look at their roster and the way they play Come playoff time, do we have 
what we need? Is there something we can tweak in our system and way we play? And more so, what do we do with our roster to make us better? And then I think Giannis has probably still got a ways to go, and he'll get there. We've seen his improvement. But you saw in this series with Miami, having Giannis with the ball out top in the half-court offense at the three-point line, trying to break down a good and committed heat defense was not going to work. Right. The guys who are the stars come playoff time, you have to be able to get a shot off the dribble. Yes. You have to be able to because Giannis can't do that. He's got that set shot three now, or he can get all the way to the rim, but he doesn't have anything in between that the stars have. And so he either needs to be used differently at this time of year, or he's going to have to develop that or both. And I would bet on him in terms of his development, because I think he's a guy that doesn't make excuses and doesn't point fingers. I think he looks in the mirror and is trying to get better all the time. And I think he will, but they just are not quite where they need to be to win a championship. They're very good. They come back next year. You know, they'll win 60 games again. They're excellent. They have great depth. All the stuff that they do is regular season stuff. Right. Great depth, right? They play defense every night. All of that stuff's great. In the playoffs, you know, I I don't know that having 11 guys – that can play really helps you. It's going to come down to your top seven or eight. That's a great way of looking at it. I, I didn't think about it in that terms of overachieving in the regular season as opposed to underachieving in the playoffs. This playoffs, like every other stand, has given me an opportunity to look at the talent on each team. And, you know, you take long looks and really deep dives into individual players and just really how good is this guy or how effective is this guy in whatever matchup he has from series to series. The guys who have really stood out to me and struck me are guys like Jamal Murray, who's still building towards being that elite level player, but watching how good some of these, these other guys who are coming up are, has been a revelation. Like I didn't realize how dynamic a player Jalen Brown was until you start watching him game to game, series to series against other high level players, like in a, in a playoff environment. And then you go, man, Jalen, he's, he's guarding Pascal Siakam better than I've seen anybody really deal with Siakam's length and, and what he brings. I mean, have you noticed certain players in these series who are just kind of redefining who and what they are based on how you watch them in this environment? The one thing the bubble has done at least being in it, right, is you're just immersed in NBA basketball. So, you know, I mean, before when I had a life, (laughs) I would catch a lot of the games. But, you know, occasionally pre-pandemic in the playoffs, you'd be off doing something else and you might miss a game. But now you watch them all. And to me, the most fun probably series so far was watching – Jamal Murray and Donovan Mitchell go back and forth and go at each other. I mean, two young stars. And we had seen it, I think, more in Donovan Mitchell, but we saw Jamal Murray step up. I agree with you on Jalen Brown. I've talked about it on the broadcast in those series. He's defended the heck out of Siakam. He's become so much better shooter, Jalen Brown has, making shots. Uh, He's a pretty even keel guy. I think Goran Dragic who's always been there. I mean, the guy was an all-NBA guy a couple of years ago, but he's still always been under the radar. I now think when you're watching the Heat story all the time, you're like, wow, that guy's pretty good. And he's certainly been their most consistent offensive player in the series. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of guys who I think in this atmosphere are getting the chance to show people what they can do at the highest levels of our game. Yeah. We always hear about how styles dictate how things go, and I would argue against that. In the years I've been covering the NBA, so many teams tend to play the same style that I think it's less about the style that you play, and it's more about the guys that match up in those specific series. I'm looking at Houston. They could match up against 20 teams in this league that would have no shot to beat them in a playoff series. But when you get down to the last seven, eight teams in the playoffs or the last four teams, but their style is negated when they face a team 
like the Lakers or like the Clippers, who will have as much star power as they have and won't be phased over the course of a best of seven because you're playing small ball or because you're playing some different style because you can adjust to that in a series. It's not like a one game, you know, scenario and that's it. You only get one shot at. It. Am I wrong in thinking that styles sometimes get negated? I think you're absolutely right because two things happen, I think. And, and number one is as a series goes on, you know, you get used to what the other people are doing. The Rockets are so extreme in the way they play, small ball, shoot 53s, the whole thing. You know, if you're coming in in the regular season, traveling into Houston, you've got to walk through to prepare for them and you go out and play, yeah, their style will take you aback a little bit. But when you can hone in on your preparation for a series and then, you know, game one, Lakers had their problems, talked about where they got caught, make your adjustments and keep moving on. So I think that's a big part of it. And I also think that points out the need for flexibility to be able to play different ways and different lineups. And and you alluded to it. And that's why I think the two LA teams have the advantage on Denver and Houston right here. Houston's locked into small ball. There's nothing else they can do. The Lakers have an answer for that. All right, we'll play Anthony Davis at the five, or even when he's out of the game, we'll play Markeith Morris at the five. We've got JaVale McGee and Dwight Howard are on the shelf, and they'll play in the next series against the Clippers, but they're not going to play in this series. So Frank Vogel has options. Nobody has more options than Doc Rivers, in my mind, in terms of what yeah. he can do with his lineups. But if you're Denver, you can't play small. Your best player is a seven-footer. So you're going to keep him on the floor, even though you're going to have some defensive problems with Jokic and the pick and rolls and things. You can't switch. You don't have that flexibility. You have no choice. It's not like Houston can say, wow, we've given up 110 paint points in the last two games. We need to go bigger and protect the rim a little. They don't have those options. And so it's not like your style will win. In fact, if you can play different ways, fast, slow, half court, if you can play big, small, you know, if you've got a little bit of diversity in your offense in terms of the ways you can score, those are the things that give you the ability to attack matchups and attack other teams' weaknesses. Like Milwaukee, when you look at it in a playoff series, what are their options? Chris Middleton's going to go off the dribble in the half court. We know he's really good. We know what Giannis can do. If you get back in transition and pack in the paint, what's your next option if you're Milwaukee? But Miami's got a lot of things, and they've got a lot in their offense. They score on cuts. They run those handoffs. They run guys off screens. They'll get some quick isolations. Dragic and Butler in pick and rolls. I mean, they just have a lot more diversity to what they can do. I think that's what works in the playoffs. I don't want to jump too far ahead of what the series are dictating now, but if I'm looking at a Final Four and I see the L.A. teams on the west side and in the east I see Miami and Boston, not that those were the four teams, not even going into the bubble, but just saying going into the season, you pick out who you think the four teams could be. I think everybody would have said the Lakers and Clippers based on what went on last summer, how teams were assembled. Boston and Miami, I don't know that anybody would have chosen either one of them based on what they did last year. Boston, underachieving by most people's standards when Kyrie was there, changing, getting Kimber Walker, didn't know how Tatum, Brown, Gordon Hayward, and all these other guys were coming together. Nobody had Miami picked, and they're the first ones to get through to the conference finals. But now when I'm looking at them, in September, after everything that's gone on, I say, who are the four teams that I could see having the kind of versatility and flexibility to be in that group? Those would be four I choose with Toronto as well. I thought Toronto was that type of team that had that kind of makeup. I don't think it's a coincidence that those are potentially the teams we'll see, Stan, because as you mentioned, the playoffs has always been about can you change whatever style or can you adapt to whatever style is needed to get through to the next round. And the more answers you've got, the more options you have, the the better off you are. And then, you know, 
the part that we we know that is most obvious is I mean your best players just have to play great on a very consistent basis. Like to me, Seku, I think the Lakers are fairly limited in the half court, quite honestly, in terms of their personnel and everything. And even the options that they have, they're so dependent on LeBron James and Anthony Davis. So when those guys only got 45 in game one, they weren't even in the game because they just need them. And now they've had 62 combined in each of the last two games. So I think they're limited. But what's gotten them through is those guys are playing at such a high level. You know, they're shooting in the high 50%. They're shooting like 58% each. They're both over 40% from three. The play of your stars is absolutely crucial. And we see it. Paul George got off to a little bit of a slow start in the playoffs. Everybody was worried. Now we see he's coming back. We know what Kawhi is. I mean, your stars and your versatility in terms of what you can do, I think, are are the whole thing. And um, it's going to be really interesting, I think, going forward on all these matchups. We're getting to what is the Final Four. To me, which is always the best part of the NBA season, as much as I love the finals, there's something about the conference finals to me that really gives you kind of a referendum on the season. We're seeing such a high level of play down here because we're not usually going into the playoffs or getting to this point in the playoffs two months into the season. Right. And that's where we are right now. We're two months into the season. That four and a half month layoff is more than what they get in an off season. Yeah. So we're only two months into the season. These guys are still, you know, they have fresh legs (laughs) and then they're not traveling. They don't have those late nights. They're back in their room. We're seeing like the ideal situation for high level basketball. This is as good as it gets in terms of watching basketball. The atmosphere may not be the same in the arenas, but to watch these guys' skills and be able to play and they have their legs under them. Going into the Laker game last night, I had people say, man, LeBron looks young. And I said, (laughs) well, not hopping on a plane after games and flying somewhere. Like, yeah, they're not worn out. Yeah. I say this all the time. At the start of the season, I don't put too much into what goes on the first month, month and a half of the season. But Christmas Day, when I tune in to that lineup of games, I'm going, all right, I better see what I'm used to from the stars who are on display that day. And you're right. That's what we're getting right now. Is we're, we're basically getting Christmas Day basketball on steroids, which nobody can complain. It is starting to shift back to normal a little bit. You know, for everybody that's following on a nightly basis, it was – all offense and very high scoring in the season right. games and through most of the first round, right? And now you see the defense is starting to clamp down. You know, game five, Boston against Toronto, Boston's defense was stifling. Toronto had trouble even getting a shot. Last night, second half, Lakers against uh, Houston. They just have locked them down last night in the second half which the Lakers are capable of doing it's still high level basketball we're just getting back to a more of a balance between the offense and defense now no question no question Stan Van Gundy from TNT joining me here on the hang time podcast always enjoyable to talk to you Stan I hate that you're over there at the fancy (laughs) digs I'm over here you know in boot camp bill but I'll hopefully see you in the building somewhere around here on campus in the NBA bubble here, man. Always good to talk to you and appreciate your insights. Well, great to talk to you. I wish I could have you up to my house for dinner. I live 40 minutes from here. But yeah, like you say, we're all here and we're on different sides of the fence so we don't see each other. No question. I'll hold you to dinner next time I'm in Orlando. That sounds good to me.